Welcome. You're listening to the 365 Firsts Podcast, a show filled with stories of experiencing first times and all the fun, growth, unknowns, and excitement that go with them. It's also the place to get expert advice, motivation, and inspiration to get in on trying new things. And now, here's your host, the master of first times, and chick you're trying to keep up with, Ann Bernard. Yes, indeed, I am the chick you want to keep up with and the voice you want in your head because I am the voice that tells you you can. Welcome to another episode of the 365 First Podcast and Expert Advice Before Your First Time series. I am your host, Anne Bernard. I love doing shows on topics that I know nothing too little about and for things that are on my 365 First Challenge list. A thing like, say, going on an African safari. I get the pleasure of learning along with all of you who are listening. Today's guest expert to give you advice for your first time going on a safari is Mike Herscott, the Senior Southern Africa Specialist in the U.S. for the award-winning travel company, Oddly Travel. At Oddly, the specialists create tailor-made trips and holidays to 87 different countries. Mike first traveled to Africa as an exchange student to the University of Cape Town, South Africa. While he was there, he took full advantage of immersing himself into the local culture and activities. He joined the surf team, went hiking, and explored as much of the country as possible. At the end of his time in South Africa, he went on a coastal road trip, surfing, hiking, and camping from Elon's Bay all the way to Tofu, Mozambique with some of his friends. They encountered some of the warmest and sweetest Koza people, saw stunning landscape and rugged coastlines. While in Lawandel, they hiked the cattle path on the cliffside, fished for their dinners, served waves few people had ever seen, cooked pap and sap with the locals, and camped on the land belonging to the village chief overlooking the sea. After eight months in Southern Africa, he was hooked. All he wanted to do was see more, learn more, and explore more of this magnificent continent. Since then, he has continued to travel all over Africa, including visits to Senegal, Namibia, Botswana, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Eswatini, Madagascar, Tanzania, Kenya, and Morocco. As a Southern Africa specialist, traveling beyond his region of expertise has allowed him to more deeply understand the breadth of possibility and how to comparatively highlight his areas of focus, which are the countries of Namibia, South Africa, Botswana, Victoria Falls region, Zambia, Malawi, and Madagascar. Welcome to the show, Mike. Thanks so much for having me, Anne. Happy to be here to talk to you all a little bit more about, you know, things to consider for your first time traveling to Africa. It's such an amazing continent with so many things that you can do and see. I hope that, uh, you know, listening to what we talk about today will, will give you a little bit better understanding of what is going to be the right experience for you. I am sure we will get there and we'll get some great advice out of you. But I got to tell you, there's not a lot of people whose background I'm envious of, but you're one of them. You, you get to qualify. So that definitely means I need to catch up and get a lot of traveling and experiences in Africa under my belt. The only place I've been to is Morocco, so I have a lot of catching up to you. Now, we got a taste of your first time in Africa from your bio, so maybe you can start things off by sharing with us what it was like to go on your first safari. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do so. I think, you know, safari is such an amazing thing. You know, it's often built up as a lot of, uh, a lot of people's bucket list trips, and I think it's just such a unique experience that you can't quite experience to the same degree anywhere else in the world. Um, my first time going on safari, um, I arrived in the uh, Kruger and Pumalanga Airport near a town called Melsprit in South Africa, and it's just one of those things that from the second you touch down, you're wowed. Here you are in just a uh, a South African, you know, town and, and, you know, the countryside. And from the second you, you walk out uh, into the arrivals hall, you see Impala just congregated by the side of the road. Um, I think they do that for dramatic effect, but it really is a warm welcome to the area. By the time you enter the park and enter, say, one of the private reserves, you know, you're welcomed by that warm Southern African hospitality. You really feel like you're out in the wilderness, out in the bush, and they brief you on the experience and 
everything gets a lot more serious. You know, you start to learn a little bit about, you know, safety guidelines, what you can expect when you're out in the bush. And it really um, offers an, a unique cross, cross section between excitement, a little bit nervous. And when you actually get out there and start seeing all of these animals close up, you know, there's not really an appropriate way to describe it because it really is awe-inspiring. And after my first safari in South Africa and seeing the big five, the thing that really grips you is what we often call the Africa travel bug. So what that did is, you know, it, it, it made me really want to go back and explore more, see more parks, see more remote destinations in Africa, like going on safari in Malawi and Zambia and Botswana and, you know, various other more, you know, discerning destinations for, you know, the avid safari goer. So safari is just one of those things that continues to inspire, excite, and definitely makes you want to come back for more. Yeah, well, it definitely sounds like something I could get hooked on. <laughs> we'll find out after I knock out my first one. But let's start, let's go through the planning process for a safari. So if I call you up and talk to you and say, hey, I'm interested on in going on a safari, what's the first thing you're going to ask me to do? For me, I think the most important thing that you can do is just close your eyes and imagine yourself on safari and write down what that picture looks like. Most people think about their safari before they actually, you know, call a company to plan it or start Googling around. And for everybody, that picture looks different. For some people, it's being in a remote part of Africa, you know, drifting through a floodplain on a Makoro and being in a vehicle with nobody else around, like you might find in Botswana. And for some people, it's seeing hundreds of thousands of wildebeest cross the Mara River in East Africa in, you know, either Kenya or Tanzania. Once you sort of identify what that picture looks like to you, whether it's open plains or riverine forest or wetlands or, you know, walking through the bush, that's a really important part of that uh, experience. And, and just to understand what you're looking for and, and the types of things that are going to be important to you when you start identifying the right destinations. For someone like me who loves a lot of outdoor activities and really, I mean, I do like some comfort, but I'd rather be roughing it. I'm probably then picturing a much different type of safari than somebody else who would probably like to be a little safer, drier, more comfortable. And there are options for both of us and everybody in between, correct? Yeah, exactly. I mean, the great thing about safari is there's everything under the sun from a basic three-star lodge with, you know, that's really experience driven. It's all about the wildlife, you know, accommodation and amenities come secondary. And then there's ultra lux five-star lodges that will surpass your wildest dreams. Thing from Swarovski binoculars in your room, high quality Canon DSLRs and, you know, private butler service. And then there's ones that you're literally sleeping in a tent on the ground. There's really everything under the sun. And, you know, based on what you're looking for out of your experience, talking to a specialist like me at Oddly Travel or figuring out what the right destination is, is an important part of, you know, figuring out what's going to be the right trip for you. It sounds like that might be a little easier than trying to figure it out on my own. I would definitely say so. I think travel to Africa service standards are so high and the experience is amazing but putting all of the logistical pieces together it really helps talking to an expert and having them organize those components because so many areas flights only depart on certain days there's really important things to know about you know the way you book the light aircrafts the various transfers who to reach out to what's a reliable company and there's so many ways that you can get led astray by by booking accommodation individually or trying to figure it out all on your own or using a non-qualified agency, you know, you can really run into some trouble. But if you do have the right assistance in planning your safari, you know, they can keep, you know, someone like myself can definitely make sure that it is going to be that trip of a lifetime. Okay, so I know a lot of people, because you mentioned the big five, and a lot of people think about going on safaris because of the animals that they want to see. What are some of the areas that have maybe the higher concentration of certain animals or what type of animals can someone expect to, to see? Can you tell us what the big fives are? Yeah, that's, an, that's a great question. I think um, it is very important that you sort of decide spotting certain, if spotting certain animals are important to you in planning your safari because so many people do want to see the big five. Now, the term big five actually comes from, um, you know, during the colonial era in Africa when 
people actually hunted in a lot of these parks. The big five refer to the animals that are most dangerous to track and hunt. Now it's sort of been uh, repurposed for the photo tourism industry. And it refers to the elephant, Cape Buffalo, rhino, leopard, and lion. These are sort of the holy grail of wildlife sightings. But I definitely wouldn't say that your, your expectations or dreams should be limited to that because, you know, there's so much more that you'd want to see on a safari. Things like the African wild dog, hyena, cheetah, and much, much more. But it is a really important thing to consider because certain areas are big five safaris. In certain areas, there's just animals you won't see due to the fact that some areas just don't have the right habitat for animals like cheetah. They may not have open plains or certain areas, unfortunately, may, may have no rhino because they were poached out. So coming into the planning process, it is important to identify some of the key animals that you really are hoping to see during your safari. I would say that the ultimate big five destination probably is South Africa just due to the fact that the Kruger National Park region has such an incredibly high concentration of wildlife that on a three to a four night safari, you're extremely likely to spot the big five. However, I would also say that it is definitely not what I would consider the best overall safari experience. Due to the fact that it is a more built up industry in South Africa, you might, you might see you know, fences around the exterior of the park and some elements that remind you of civilization and being in a, a developed part of the world. Whereas when you go to destinations like the Okavango Delta in Botswana or the South Luangwa National Park in Zambia, you truly feel like you're out in an untouched wilderness where the traces of human presence and development you know, are unseen. It's really you, your guide, and an absolutely stunning wilderness. And so those are all the components that you have to consider as well. You know, how long do you want the safari to be? What animals are the most important to you? And, and um, you know, quite a few other considerations as well to identify the right destination. The latter to me sounds a lot more interesting. The former in South Africa sounds like that's a tourist trap. And you're going you're gonna to get to have the sense like you're saying like hey uh you are in africa but you're surrounded by a bunch of other tourists and so, it's not a, a authentic experience because of it so so you know i i would actually disagree with that just being that there are some elements that do make um you know your experience on a south african safari feel a little bit less remote but it's the best first safari that you can think of. It's my, it was my first safari experience. And at the time, when, when I first safaried in the Kruger region, I wasn't aware of the breadth of safari possibilities available. And it's pretty amazing that, you know, spending four nights in safari and seeing everything that you've ever dreamed of, that inspires me to go back and see more and explore further to places that I'd never even imagined when I was going on my first safari. So referring to Kruger as a little bit more developed is coming from someone who's been on, you know, over 100 game drives and has been on safari in 10 different countries. So I, I wouldn't necessarily write off South Africa. And I think it's a, a really great opportunity for someone to, you know, have their first African experience, maybe spend some time in Cape Town, go on safari in the Kruger region, then maybe jump up to the Victoria Falls. And then, you know, that experience is going to inspire them to come back to Africa and this time maybe go to Botswana or Zambia and have a little bit more of a deeper, more remote experience. Okay, so it's a, it's a good way of dipping your toes in the pool and getting, getting a taste for it. And it is, like you were saying, there's things that you can do before and after the safari itself because South Africa is a develops um, African country that has a lot more to offer. So let's talk about budget then, because where you go and how long you stay is going to impact your budget. What's the minimum amount of nights you or days you would recommend? Like, don't go less than, you know, don't do the trip less than this many days and be prepared to at least budget this amount. Yeah, that is a tricky question, you know, c considering the various, you know, areas you might want to include in your trip. If the primary focus of your trip is safari driven, then I would recommend a minimum of six to eight nights on safari. Anything less than that, I think you'll find yourself leaving wanting more. As I mentioned earlier, if you're looking to sort of have an introductory experience, something like three or four nights in the Kruger is a, is a great way to start. But if you're really focused on being out in the wilderness and want a full safari experience, 
um, you know, the ideal amount of time is, is, is definitely over six nights. But just to sort of give you an idea of the price point, I would say that an itinerary that would include something like four nights in Cape Town, three nights in the Kruger region, and two nights in Victoria Falls, in a four-star range during peak season is probably going to be around $6,000 per person. Whereas if you were to consider a Botswana safari, say six nights between the Okavango Delta, um, a region uh, called uh, the Linyanti Wetlands, and then say two nights in the Victoria Falls, that would be um, an eight-night trip. And during peak season, you would probably expect to spend, you know, close to $11,000 per person for an experience like that for a four-star level. Okay. Well, that's a good baseline to go off of. And again, yeah, for four-star level, just chime in. you know, you can go up or down on, on that. Yeah. And I, I, the thing I would just chime in is that I think seasonality is such an important thing in safari. And again, that's why I think talking to an expert is really helpful. A lot of uh, my clients, I actually plan their itineraries for the very tail end of shoulder season to save them quite a bit of budget, but still experience a high season safari. So you can drop the safari cost from 1500 per person per day in the Okavango Delta in Botswana closer to $1,000 per person per day, simply by moving from the month of July to June. Now, if you plan your trip at the very tail end of June, you're basically going to be experiencing high season conditions on your safari, um, but you're going to be paying the shoulder season rate. And for the more you know, experienced traveler looking to make sure that they're going to get you know, the best value out of their experience, that's a really great way to, um, you know, stretch your budget a little bit further. But speaking of the peak season, does it vary from country to country? It does vary country to country. I, w I would say that, you know, overall, the summertime in North America is the best time to be on safari in Africa. You know, there are nuances um, between the destinations, but generally speaking, the August-September period is going to be the best time to go on safari in nearly all countries that we represent in Africa. And that, ex that extends to, you know, South Africa, Botswana, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Malawi, Tanzania, Kenya, and beyond. All of those areas have experience that we would associate with peak season in that aug August and September timeframe. That is very good to know. Now, obviously you need a passport to go to Africa. What else yeah. should someone be ready to have and do besides obviously planning the trip and, and all that good stuff. But what else do they need to be able to travel there? Coming off of a passport, I think another thing you need to consider is visas. Most of Southern Africa do not require prearranged visas to travel. You can get them all on arrival, but East Africa tends to be a little bit more tricky where you need to either apply for them in advance online and some areas will allow you to get them on arrival. In addition, certain countries um, do require uh, a yellow fever vaccination card, which shows proof that you've gotten the yellow fever vaccination. That's not required at all for anywhere in Southern Africa, but it is required for certain East African countries. So, you know, depending on the destination that you select for your safari, there are various considerations that you need to, you know, make sure that you have enough of time to, you know, plan to to have, you know, a certain vaccination or get a visa in advance before you, before you actually travel. Um, I think, you know, it's tough to sort of, you know, a, with a blanket statement, how to prepare for safari as a whole in terms of that, that type of documentation. It can be a little bit more country specific, but I think the most important thing is making sure that you're comfortable with the, the overall cost, uh, the length of international travel to access these destinations. You do have an updated passport. And if you are traveling with children, there are other considerations you need to take into account, which would be um, traveling with an un unabridged birth certificate, or say if you're traveling with grandkids, a written affidavit um, authorizing them to travel to these destinations. Okay, so there is, you can't just, you, just because you have the money doesn't decide I can call you and tomorrow I'm going on a safari. Obviously, there's, there's additional planning and preparation depending on, on, where, on where you want to go and getting your yellow fever shot. Do I need to be worrying about malaria, netting for my bedding? What, as far as my packing, are there like big consideration as far as that goes? Yeah, I mean, again, it'll vary a little bit destination to destination. 
Um, in terms of, you know, medical requirements, you know, it is important to always consult a medical professional, especially whose uh, focus is in travel before you, before you do make the trip. Generally speaking, with the exception of the few countries in East Africa um, that do have a requirement for yellow fever vaccination, everything else is elective and it is a very personal choice. Quite a few of my clients will travel with malaria tablet or maybe get a typhoid vaccination, but quite a few do not. So speaking to a medical professional and, you know, getting a better understanding of what might be right for you and your, and, and, and your specific circumstances is an important part of the process. In terms of, um, you know, things like packing and netting, at the end of the day, the camps are going to make sure that you are extremely comfortable and well looked after and taken care of. And that means, you know, having mosquito netting around the bed. They have bug spray in all the rooms. In case you forget um, an electrical converter, they'll have an extra one behind the desk. When in doubt, your camp is going to take care of you. And that's sort of the bottom line of safaris. You know, when you when you stay with the right camp, you're going to be in good hands and well looked after. And, you know, um, you'll feel comfortable once you arrive. So you do not have, even if I choose to go the route or I'm sleeping in the, I'm sleeping on the ground in the middle of nowhere, uh, the camp's going to take care of that nothing's going to come and get me in the middle of the night. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> um, it depends. You know, if you sit, so as a professional in the travel industry, we primarily organize our clients stay in, in lodge style or camp style accommodation where um, you don't really need to worry about those sort of considerations. If you were to decide, if you, if you were to decide to independently organize, say, a, um, a more camping style trip, it is important that, you know, think about where you're going to store your food. You know, what are you going to do if you use the bathroom in the middle of the night? What, what is going to be safe for me? But, I would say that that's definitely not what I would recommend for anybody's first safari. You know, a, a more rustic camping style safari is what I would recommend for the adventure seeker and um, the seasoned safari goer. Before you, were, you, you consider, uh, you know, camping in territory that's inhabited by dangerous predators, you need to have experience in that environment and navigating those areas prior to just going for it. Because, you know, you do always, you, you know, someone may forget and, and leave an apple in their tent. Elephants love fruit and you don't want a massive elephant knocking through your tent to get an apple. And those sort of things are, are, are really important to consider if you were to consider to plan something more rustic. But for our, our types of guests who, who are going to stay in more lodge style accommodation, you know, there's not much beyond an adventurous spirit and a lighthearted attitude that you need to, to you know, really plan before you go. I'm, I'm paying close attention. <laughs> What's something that can, that you've seen throughout the years people do that kind of ruined the trip for them. Obviously you want to go, you want to take pictures and you want to enjoy that, but you have certain advice and, and thoughts on how to get out there, connect with nature and just really, you know, get the most out of your time. Yeah. I would say the thing that I encounter most often is people being very attached to their devices and their cameras. I know Photography is such an important part of the safari experience, and it's one of the reasons that I love it so much. But when you are looking through a lens, you do feel detached from the real life experience. So I think my number one recommendation would be to take a moment, put down the camera, you know, put down the phone, and just really take in what you're seeing and appreciate it through, you know, your eyes and, and that lens rather than through your device. And for me, that's the way to have the most meaningful and deep connection to nature. Um, so in between some of your great, great photo ops, I think it just really is important to take a step back and take in your environment outside of using an electronic device. What's the biggest group you've planned a trip for in the past? Because I, so, I know you don't um, do groups, but let's say someone wants to kind of do a, a group trip or they have a big family. Is there, what's the largest number of people you can probably accommodate a trip for? Yeah. So while the norm is, you know, couples and smaller families, every now and then we do get a multi-generational um, inquiry or um, a really large group of family and friends. And we really don't have any limits on what we can do. And if anything, it allows me to get creative with my knowledge and expertise, utilizing specific properties and, you know, camps 
that have exclusive uh, exclusive use chalets and private guides and things like that. But I would say what I would personally consider a larger group would be in the eight to 10 person range. I have organized trips for up to up to 12 and 14 people, but that is more the outlier, whereas the norm for large families and groups would be eight to 10. All right. Yeah, we have a much larger family than that, but I don't know if I could get everyone to go. <laughs> might be, yeah. It might be a little tricky on that one. So I was just, I was just wondering, can you tell us a little bit more about, we kind of cover some of the services that you offer, but if, so, if people are listening, how do they get in touch with you and what type of service can they uh, expect to uh, get from you? Awesome. So um, to work with a company like Oddly Travel, I think the most important thing you can do is go to our website, oddlytravel.com, and look at some of the sample itineraries that we have on our website. Everything that we do is tailor-made and customized for our clients, but our sample itineraries highlight some of the more popular experiences our clients are seeking out. So for someone going in looking to plan their first safari, it gives you know, it allows you um, to find some content for inspiration to help customize and tailor make your own trip. That way, once you feel like you're ready, you can send in an inquiry to us and someone like myself be able to give you a call. And once you have that baseline of what you might be looking for or certain a photo or an itinerary inspired you, we'll then talk to you about what really matters to you in your experience, what type of uh, you know, accommodation you're looking for, the overall atmosphere of the trip, the pace of the travel, the dates you're looking to travel, um, you know, your overall budget, and, you know, various components so that at the end of our conversation, I'll know about you, I'll know your family, I'll know what you're looking for, and I can most effectively plan the right experience for you and your trip so that you end up with something that is going to be in line with your dreams and your expectations. All right. That sounds perfect. Did I forget anything? No, I think, I think, you know, the most important thing when you are planning your safari is just to go in with an open mind and be open to, you know, your travel experts, advice and recommendations. I think it's easy to be swayed by, you know, what your friends did or what you've read about online or what you've heard about. But at the end of the day, that that's not always the best thing. Sometimes it's the thing that you've never heard about that's going to give you the experience you never knew you wanted. And I think that's the most important thing to remember um, when you are planning your trip, that sometimes the unexpected can be the most memorable part of the trip. Uh, I love that. That's, yeah, I love the concept of go approach it with an open mind and don't try to completely recreate what you've seen of what you've heard, but make it unique to, to your experience. Like you said, at the beginning of the show, you know, when you close your eyes and what you imagine and then what can just materialize and come to be so that it's, it is a once a lifetime trip or it's a trip that gets you off to exploring what sounds like an incredible continent. Now I do have one final question that everybody gets. What is a first time or new experience that is on your list? Uh, that's always a tough one. You know, there's so much to do and see. Um, but I think for me, it, it has to be um, seeing the, the mountain gorillas in, uh, you know, U Uganda, Rwanda, or the Congo, something that's always eluded me and I, I would love to do. Um, I've had primate experiences in the past, hiking through Madagascar, looking for lemurs or tracking chimpanzees in the Mahale Mountains in Tanzania, but I've always wanted to see the mountain gorilla families um, in, you know, Virunga, Bwindi, or um, Volcanoes National Park. So that's definitely on the list, and I, you know, I, I hope in the next couple of years I'll be able to do that myself. Oh, well, I definitely hope that comes to pass for you sooner rather than later. How can people get in touch with you? I would say that our website is going to be the best way to get in touch with us at Oddly Travel. Um, if you follow the, our Africa trips and make an inquiry on the website, one of our experts will reach out to you. To get in touch with myself, My, uh, you can reach out to me on my email at mike.herseott at oddlytravel.com. And that is a U D L E Y T R A V E L dot com. And that would be the best way to get in touch. You know, 
mentioned that you heard you heard me on the podcast and um, I'd be happy to start working with you to plan your perfect trip. All right. Well, awesome. Thank you so much for being on the show and sharing all this great information. Uh, really appreciate it. My pleasure. And thank you so much for, um, you know, taking the time. And I just hope that, um, you know, our conversation inspires other people to take their first trip to Africa and just, you know, see another part of the world. Oh, I certainly hope so. All right. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I know it got me even more excited about going on my first safari and I learned a lot from it and gave me a lot to think about. I do have an announcement to make about the podcast. When I kicked off the expert advice before your first time series, I was, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Yeah, overly ambitious. So for the last two months, I've released two episodes a week. And I'm not going to lie to you, it is extremely time consuming to do this, to find a guest, book the guest, record the interview, then do the editing and everything that is required to release an episode. Because I am now launching a webinar, so every five days I am doing the Start Your Journey of First Time and New Experience webinar, and then I'm also launching a program called Maximize Your Journey Program. Additionally, I want to do more live videos on Facebook and Instagram, and I want to go back to reviving the YouTube channel. Based on all of that and the fact that I'm primarily still just a one-woman show, I have decided to cut back to releasing only one episode a week of the Expert Advice Before Your First Time series. I will continue to do my Wednesday show. And then based on what happens with the live Facebook first time storytelling, I might add an episode that has other people's first time stories. We'll see how that all plays out. I would, of course, love your feedback on it. So send me an email at contact at 365firstchallenge.com. I would love to know what expert advice you would like to receive so I know who to invite. And of course, I also want to invite you to the live Facebook events, which will take place every Wednesdays at 9 Pacific Standard Time, 9, 10, 11, 12, noon Eastern Standard Time. And the Facebook page page in question is the 365 First a Challenge Facebook page. If you're interested in being featured on one of those live events, you know how to contact me. Now, if you're not subscribed to the show, please do so while you're there. Leave a review. And until we meet again, get out there and have first times and new experiences. You've been listening to the 365 Firsts Podcast. Hope you've gotten inspired to start your journey of first times and new experiences. Join the 365 Firsts Challenge by downloading the app at your local app store. Check out Next Level Firsts Coaching for additional assistance. Contact us if you want to share the stories of your latest firsts on the show. Now, go get busy having new experiences.